Members, we have a quorum uh, and are now in public session. So welcome to today's meeting of the Public Counts Committee. Can I remind members that mobile phones must be set to aeroplane mode or turned off, as it's not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode, as they can continue to interfere with the assembly recording. The session is being recorded in video and audio, and can be accessed live via online streaming, either on the assembly website or Democracy Live. Can I turn now to item one on the agenda? Apologies. Uh, and advise members that the chair has sent his apologies, is unable to join us for this meeting and has also and has given his apologies. Uh, and also apologies have been received from Matthew Tull, MLA, Mr William Irwin, MLA, and Orla Flynn, MLA. Is that all the apologies? Are there any other? Yeah, okay. Um, Agenda item number two, minutes of the meeting of the 16th of September 2021. They are in your pack at pages 7 to 11. Are members content uh, that they would be signed as being accurate? Yeah, yes, Carl, are you content? Content. Chair, sure, I just want to make a point. Um, last week I was on the meeting and then the system went down to try to get back in and it the access was denied, so I just want to put that on record, sure. Have I made? Okay. Can we deal with the accuracy of the minutes? Uh, and, and certainly, if you put that on record, members are aware of it, and staff are aware of it. Uh, and sometimes it can be uh, localised internet access, as opposed to uh, it may be complicating factors at this end, but it can be localised as well. In terms of the accuracy of the minutes, is anyone prepared to indicate their, that they are content and support? Me? Mr. Hillage and um, has, has indicated. Members all agreed. Agreed. Yeah. agreed. Okay. Uh, I will then Cahill sign is the, in minutes. the minutes as attending. Pardon. Cahill is in the minutes as attending. In any case, is that okay, Cahill? Yeah. Okay. So, so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Do I sign the minutes now, or is that subsequent? Uh, yeah. No, it's true. Do you have them? Bottom of your pack. Are these, are these here? Right, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Just bear with me a few, few moments. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, be normal to have matters arising the minutes that are not on the agenda. Is, is there anything anyone wishes to raise? Um, so yeah, if you just uh, item three is the declaration of interests and then matters arising. All oh, right, you've done it that way. Okay. For, firstly, do then uh, declaration of members' interests. Um, at each meeting, members are required to register relevant financial or other interests uh, that uh, they may have in the proceedings that are are, are going on today. Does any member have anything they wish to declare? Okay. Can we then deal with matters arising in the minutes? Are there any matters arising in the minutes that are not on the agenda at some other location that someone wishes to raise at this point? No matters arising. Has the clerk any matters arising you wish to raise? No, Chair. Okay. Thank you. That being the, the case, we'll, we'll proceed. Moving now to item number five. Correspondence and members, you will find this in your packet, pages 21 to 78. Um, during the meeting is Mr. Kieran Donnelly, CB, the Comptroller and Auditor General, and Mr. Kyle Bingham, the Assembly uh, Support Officer, who is joining us remotely. Uh, can we just confirm how we can with us, Kyle? Yes, can you hear us, Kyle? Yes, Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you. Members, can I refer you to correspondence stated the 10th of September, at page 21 of your pack? It's from the Committee of Infrastructure regarding primacy over the Northern Ireland Audit Office reports. The committee is requesting that we provide information on oncoming reports relating to the department uh, for the infrastructure uh, when available. Uh, can I suggest we write back to the Infrastructure Committee to advise them that there are no reports currently on the programme and on our programme. Uh, and in terms of previous report, the committee has considered them 
OR on the major capital projects, which concludes the PAC inquiry process, and therefore it may be of interest to the Infrastructure Committee to perhaps pick up some issues uh, and subsequently deal with them, but our scrutiny is over. Are you content that we would do that? Agreed? Okay. I would also refer you to correspondence dated the 14th of September 2021 at page 22 of your pack from Mr. Mark Bryan. Um, let's see, AO. AO of DA, is that this? The accounting officer officer of the Department of Education, in which he highlights the actions that the department has undertaken to address the PAC concerns into the number of surplus places in schools. The uh, PAC concluded an inquiry on the sustainability of schools in 2016, and recommendation number four of that report committed the department to uh, uh, review of the approved enrolment numbers and to report back to the committee. Mr. Brown has in- included a copy of the department's report, the pages 23 to 51 of your pack, highlighting what actions the department has taken to progress this recommendation. The report provides the department's assessment of accommodation capacity in primary schools in response to these recommendations. Capacity is also made on the difficulties associated with assessing the accommodation capacity in post-primary schools. Special schools and nursery schools are not included in the assessment. The report concludes that while accommodation is undoubtedly one element of the capacity of a school to deliver the curriculum, there are many other areas teaching and non-teaching staff and general operations, etc., which have a much greater impact on the cost of delivery. The report also includes that of much greater value would be the study of the wider costs of education delivery within the Northern Ireland education system, including the cost of accommodation, and in particular the costs associated with the reliance on smaller schools. Uh, CNIG, do you have any comments that you wish to make at this point? Uh, just a couple of initial comments, Chair. Uh, well, this report, uh, the PAC report, is five years old. It's way back to 2016, so it's taken them quite a while to come up with this. The bottom line on it is, um, you know, there, there are published figures on surplus school places, and uh, I suppose the committee's concern at the time was the robustness of those figures, how they were cal- So it's a technical thing how those figures are actually calculated. Um, so it's taken them a long time to actually come up with this, and uh, there's, a, there's an awful lot of caveats in it. So I think what I'll want to do is have a detailed look at it, uh, and uh, before, before giving you a, so it's only just come in, uh, come back to the committee with our, uh, a full assessment of it. Uh, but it is important that um, any figure work that sort of drives policy is reasonably reliable. And uh, we had, and the committee had, question marks in the past on the, the reliability and the robustness of the, just the figure work, really. Uh, but I think the way this one is presented, it, it, makes, it makes something that should be simple seem very complicated. Uh, uh, so I want to have a good look at it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Deputy Chair. Um, I would agree with the, what the CNNG says about this. Um, I opened um, the pack for today, uh, yesterday evening, and looked through this report, and it's quite a, a detailed report. Um, more complex, probably, than what it should be, um, and I think it's important that we give it further consideration, because whilst it was five years ago when this was done, it actually is a really, really key issue because the um, surplus school places and its impact upon education system, but also upon our finances, is one of the key issues facing us here at the moment. And there's, I've got a number of questions I would like to go back in relation to the report that's been received. Um, I don't know whether we want to do that today or do we want to consider the report at a future meeting, which gives us a good chance to, as the CNIG says, to, to go through it um, uh, or send those in writing or whatever. But I think it's important that we do give a consideration because we've dealt with lots of different reports, but this is actually, you know, okay, it's five years old, but it's a really, really key report. 
We'll take a range of views yeah, and then perhaps come, come to a conclusion. Uh, Mr Hill, as you've indicated. Thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I think I agree with, with Andrew Muir there in, in relation to how we go forward. I think it should be after maybe the CNAG has a look at it first and comes back to us with some points. Could I ask, since it's five <coughs> years ago, uh, did somebody pr really prompt it to do this, or is this just a surprise coming in on your part? Uh, well, all departments are required to track the recommendations from this committee, so this one is just uh, as part of the tracking system. So we didn't prompt it. Didn't uh, prompt they, it no, we didn't. Uh, they just only five those. years ago. It's so. just taken a long time to come up with it. Okay, thank you. Um, it's taken a surprisingly long time. Like I know the assembly mm. wasn't uh, here for three years, but surely it, that could have been sitting there ready to feed back a year ago. You know, it's 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 taken a surprisingly long time. Um, been suggesting to a number of members that we come back to this issue and look at it in detail, uh, along with the CNAG. Are members content with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> Do we wish to forward this uh, initial report to the Education Committee, or do we wait to we further scrutinise it ourselves? What are members' thoughts? Chair, I think we need to wait to see just exactly where we're going on. Okay, members content with that, but again, we need to do it recently. Yeah, in the maybe recent, two or three uh, weeks or something. Yeah, we shouldn't put it off weeks. forever. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Clear. okay, content members. Yep. Thank you. I refer you now to correspondence dated the 16th of September at pages 52 to 78 in your pack. I'm Colin Boyle, the Accounting Officer of the Department of Finance, regarding an update on the Land Registry Fees Order. In the PAC's Major Capital Projects Report, the level of Land Registry Fees was addressed in paragraphs 70 72. The Committee noted that the Department had commissioned analysis by the University, University of Ulster's, uh, Ulster University's rather, Economic Policy Centre of the likely impact on the property market of the pandemic. The Department intend to use this analysis to inform the new fee proposal. Mr Boyle has attached the finalised report by the Ulster University's property market analysis to inform land registration fees. <coughs> um, Mr Boyle has asked the committee to note at paragraph 16 of the report that a more reliable analysis should be conducted when the market moves into a new steady state. This would mean not making any changes to the current land registry fees until that analysis is undertaken. This view has been unanimously agreed by the Rules Committee. We must be consulted in relation to the changes of any land registry rules under the Land Registration Act of 1970. Further analysis will therefore be commissioned in the first quarter of the next financial year with a view to bringing forward a revised fees order, if appropriate, uh, in the next mandate of the Assembly. Uh, CNAG, have you any comments? Uh, yes, Chair. I suppose the background to this is that these fees weren't regularly reviewed in the past, and um, at one point they were much higher because there was more activity in the property market and they were much higher than needed to recover the cost of the service. So the committee then uh, said, recommended this should be looked at urgently. Uh, the department's coming back and said, well, yeah, our advice is uh, the market is very volatile at the minute, uh, which is a fair point. Uh, but I think then um, it's important then the issue doesn't go off the, the radar and that uh, the department probably should come back to the committee in say, six months' time just for, for an update if the market actually stabilises. So with COVID, the market is genuinely... Uh, very, very volatile and unpredictable at the moment, but when things settle, then the issue will need to be addressed. Members, have you any further comments you wish to make? Are you content then that this would be uh, continue to be monitored and perhaps with the next committee, <laughs> we may be in post, but it may, may even come, come to us um, uh, if, if we get feedback before that, but probably the next committee. So content to note yep. and monitor for the future. Okay. Members, we will remain in open session for our next agenda item, the Memorandum of Reply from the Driver and Vehicle Agency 2019-2020. Uh, 
can I ask that Ms Colette Cain, Director from the Audit Office, uh, would join us? Uh, can you be brought into the spotlight? Uh, Ms Cain, can you hear us? S sorry, we can't hear you. Are you on mute, Colette? There's been a suggestion to check your mute button in case it's as simple as that, but I imagine you have. Um, your volume's turned down. The volume doesn't affect your mic. Uh, still no linkage. Um, uh, can the Assembly Broadcasting do anything on this, or what do we ask her to disconnect and re reconnect again? Um, in the Starleaf, uh, Colette can go into her AV settings and... Could you, can you please explain? Yeah, um, if Colette can hear me in her Starleaf, she can go into um, AV settings and um, microphone array and adjust the volume there. That might be the problem if she's unmuted. If, if there's a difficulty here, uh, perhaps do we leave this item and come back to it whilst um, there's an attempt for, for to, to re-engage and link in again? Um, yeah, even if Colette leaves the meeting and tries to reconnect. Yeah. Um, so Colette, if you want to leave and reconnect, we will go on to the next item and then try to come back to you and hopefully that'll, that'll work. So members will temporarily then go on to item number seven, uh, the memorandum of reply regarding the uh, capacity and capability of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. And it's at pages 87 to 97. And we have Kieran and Mr Bingham already in place. Uh, I refer you to the correspondence dated the 12th of August 2021 regarding the Public Accounts Committee's fifth report, capacity and capability into the Northern Ireland Civil Service. And the memorandum of reply received, which is in your packs at pages 87 to 89, and which was presented to the Assembly on the 12th of August 2021. Members, you will recall there were 12 recommendations either for the Department of Finance, the Executive, or both. 11 recommendations have been accepted. Recommendation number 11 regarding the role of Northern Ireland Civil Service Commissioners has been noted as it falls outside the remit of the Northern Ireland Civil Service itself. Um, from recommendation number one, the, the uh, head of, CHOC as head of? Head of the Civil Service. Head of the Civil Service have a key leadership role in driving change and transforming in the capacity and capability of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. The First Minister and the Deputy First Minister have jointly agreed that the newly created Executive Office, the TEO, Permanent Secretary's role will include working closely with the Head of the Civil Service on cross-cutting issues, including the Northern Ireland Civil Service of the future. From recommendation number 12, uh, people's strategy actions for the next six months are prioritised as follows the recruitment and workforce planning, talent management, employee relations project, and the further development of HR operating model. The department will work over the next three to six months to focus on strategic HR and organizational development at the center of government to deliver cross-cutting transformation in the context of the wider Northern Civil Service transformation agenda. CNAG, have you any comments? Uh, this is a very positive response, Chair, so it's a fairly fulsome, positive response to all the recommendations. There's the one recommendation on the Civil Service Commission, which is beyond the, the remit, uh, and um, that really would lie with the Secretary of State. So I suppose there may be an option on that one for 
the committee to, to write to the, the Secretary of State. Uh, but what is particularly pleasing on this is the, I think it's the first line where there's a, a commitment for all the key players. They're all signed up to this. So uh, it's not just the OF, it's the Executive Office and Hawks and Civil Service Board. So the very first line is uh, everybody speaking with the one voice on this. Uh, what I would say is, uh, is one thing, except all of this, there's an enormous amount of work in the implementation of these recommendations, uh, and some of them will take uh, you know, a bit of time, so having a good tracking system will be absolutely important. I suppose even for this committee then to, to track uh, and maybe invite uh, witnesses back, uh, perhaps before the end of the mandate, just to see how, how things are are getting along, given this is probably the the biggest report from the committee uh, in this in this mandate. Okay. Any any other members wish to indicate? I know Andre from your Thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, I think it's good that the, all the recommendations have been accepted. Obviously, there was one that's been noted, and I think in that regard, possibly a letter to the Secretary of State around that or something, because within that's within his remit or whatever in relation to that. But um, the reform that's required within the civil service is a bit like turning an oil tanker, but we really need to be putting the fit to the floor in relation to that because we've already seen in different parts of the economy the whole issue in terms of skill shortages, shortage of labour. We also are aware that the risks in relation to civil service are much more acute because of an uh, older workforce and the issue in terms of retirements coming up and all the rest of it. So I was going to suggest as well that we do have a new head of the civil service in place. I think we agreed a number of weeks ago to invite that person to come to the committee, and I think it would be good to follow that up, not for an inquiry, but more just to understand about what that person's vision is to implement the various reports, because they've got this. You have the major capital projects as well, and it would be good to have an understanding of how we are actually going to turn this tanker around, because we really do need to do that. Any other comments from members? Um, members agreed then that we would follow up the one recommendation which was not responded to, which is uh, applicable to the Secretary of State to respond to. Members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Okay. Um, uh, invitation to the new head of the civil service to attend that I, I can't recall. I think we did. Um, yes, Joanne? Um, on the forward work programme, um, there's a, a a letter is going to Fox for her to come in uh, November. Okay, oh, right. okay. Right. That's great, so then. There we go. Content with that, then? He's okay. captured great. <laughs> members, members agreed with those actions? Okay. Um, let me see. So that's that item finished. Have we managed to link up with Colette again? Hello, Chair. Can you hear me now? We can hear you loud and clear. We'll, we'll therefore go back. Uh, they get my reference. Go back to that item. It's item number seven. Sorry, it was item number six. Item number six. And where was it? In my briefing pack. Item six, um, which is the memorandum of reply regarding the driver and vehicle agency, 2019-20, which is at pages 80 to 86 of your pack members. Uh, <clears throat> so here uh, we have uh, Kieran Donnelly, CNIG, the Skelet Cain Director, and Mr. Kyle Bingham, uh, Assembly Sport Officer, coming in remotely. Uh, and I refer back to the correspondence dated the 26th of July 2021 regarding the PNIC 6 report and to the Driver and Vehicle Agency 2019-20 and the memorandum of reply now received, which is in your pack at pages 80 to 86. The MOR is the executive's formal response to the PAC report and was presented to the Assembly on the 26th of July, 2021. Members, you will note that, all, that three recommendations coming out of the report have been accepted. Of note is that the department is commissioning a review of the appropriateness of DVA continuing uh, to operate its full trading fund. It is anticipated that the review will be progressed by the end of 21-22 financial year. CNAG, have you any comments? 
Uh, now again, this is, there's only three recommendations here, but the response in all is, is positive. Um, and the review they're carrying out, uh, the committee always also asked that that would encompass uh, a review of the effectiveness of customer service. There's lots of complaints in that area, so they've accepted that as well. Uh, I'll just ask if there's anything else you want to add. Uh, thank you, Synergy. I think um, that the highlight has been the um, agreement to review the um, DVA, but um, also, I suppose, uh, members at the time were concerned about the um, life of the uh, vehicle lifts, and um, it is interesting to note that um, DVA have indicated they have installed cycle counters on, on all or the vast majority of the lifts, um, which will obviously aid that process of estimating useful life going forward. So, um, but yes, a um, very um, positive report in terms of agreeing all the recommendations, accepting all the recommendations. Uh, any other members wish to comment? Um, Again, perhaps for the benefit of the public, you might be, be listening in that the report was largely into the failure of the, the, the lifts and the contracts, et cetera, around that, uh, as opposed to the current ongoing difficulties <laughs> that are being experienced by the DBA. So the report was into uh, the failings uh, and that occurred actually pre-pandemic. Um, okay, if members are key, agreed, then we'll move on. Um, any other issues then? So we're then at item eight in the agenda. <coughs> and again, we have Kieran Dolly and Kyle Bingham, Assembly Support Officer. Um, and I refer for you to correspondence from uh, the CNAG, Kieran Donnelly, CB, dated the 20th of September 2021, on pages 99 to 101 of your pack, regarding a ministerial direction from the Education Minister to proceed with the Stroll Shared Education Campus Programme. The Permanent Secretary received a direction from the Education Minister dated the 7th of July 2021, and this approach was endorsed by the Executive uh, in, originally in September 2020. Okay. Um, I have a blank page here. I'm just wondering if there are some pages missing in my briefing. Okay. Okay, thank you. The current proposal, therefore, uh, follows on from the previous minister's position uh, uh, of, 20, sorry, of August 2020, when he agreed to seek executive approval to issue a ministerial direction, which was approved. There would appear to have been some delays in progressing this. To date, the £45 million has been invested in the shared campus scheme. The latest estimate is that up to a further £182 million investment is required to complete the construction of the campus. Members, the relevant correspondence which underpins the decision to proceed with the delivery of the scheme is at pages 101 to 162 of your pack, uh, including annexes A, B, C and D. CNAG, could you take us through the details of the ministerial direction? Uh, in particular, I note that the previous business case approval, which was given in respect of the 2016 business case addendum, expired on the 31st of March 2021. A further addendum was prepared, prepared but this has not been approved on the basis that the case, uh, in, in terms of value for money, uh, could you address this point in particular? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I suppose back, members might recall that this is one of the projects we actually looked at in the major capital projects report and has been plagued by delays. Um, there was a problem getting sufficient interest in the market when it was put out to tender uh, on, on bidder, and then the, the decision was taken not, not to proceed. So uh, there's been stop and so, so there's been various there's original business case and various addendums to it. The latest addendum then, uh, the account officer, that, that it doesn't satisfy value for money. Now, in the materials sent to us, there, there's scant detail behind that, so I want to get more behind it. Uh, and I'd like to bring Patrick in, so he's been making some inquiries as to exactly where 
uh, why uh, it's not satisfying the value for money test according to the accounting officer. Okay, Patrick Barr is. Uh, yes, Patrick Barr is online. Yeah. Could we have Patrick Barr in the spotlight and have you any further comments? Uh, can you hear me okay, Chair? Yes, loud and clear. Excellent. Um, as as um, CNAG said, um, the most recent business case that was in place expired in March of this year and a further addendum was prepared. In terms of value for money, um, there, there were a number of issues. So the, the, the overall is in terms of the overall cost um, of this program when compared to five individual standalone schools. So the, the total cost would be much higher and also then the, the cost per student place of this development when compared to five um, individual schools. Um, now, the reasons for this, um, there's a significant amount of additional floor space required um, when compared to five individual schools for circulation uh, and so on. Um, there's also a significant amount of site preparation here. So in relation to demolition of existing buildings, decontam decontamination of site and so on. Um, external road works also required. And then because of the sharing of sports facilities across uh, the whole campus, there's a need for um, changing pavilions beside the sports facilities rather than at the school. So um, also at additional cost. Um, also things like maintenance buildings, plant rooms, because this is a four story building instead of the normal one or two for schools, um, additional stairs and lifts, and then also large car parking and bus parking facilities um, are also required. So. For those reasons and those additional costs, some of which um, are, are required and fall within the value for money, but those additional costs um, push um, the total cost of this around about 40 to 45 million above what five separate standalone schools uh, would be judged as costing. And also then the, the pupil place uh, per pupil place would be uh, would be higher as well. Um, I think alone in the floor space, it's, it's about 15 percent extra floor space is required. Uh, for this development, when compared to um, when compared to five standalone schools, so it, it's for those reasons, Chair, that um, when you take this additional cost, additional requirements, and compare it to a benchmark for what would be expected for five schools of this size, um, it it doesn't stack up in terms of value for money because it's well beyond the benchmark. You always expect economies of scales, but yeah. you've given an explanation there. But thank you for that, Mr. McHugh. You wish to speak. Yes, well, I'd actually welcome the decision that as well too, because uh, I think there's anyone that understands and knows uh, about this project that it has about societal change in many respects. Uh, it's a shared campus, uh, and the people of Oma and the schools not on the Oma area uh, are, are waiting on its development. And uh, and I know that uh, apart from the educational benefits. Uh, I do feel it will be a sort of a landmark type project that will show the way forward for many generations and that in the future as well too, for the integration uh, of all of our people within society. So uh, I, I welcome. Okay. Uh, any other member comments? Uh, again, uh, our focus sh uh, sh should touch mainly on, on the procedural side and, and the economic side, but obviously members may wish to co comment a little bit further than that. Mr. Muir. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the delivery of new uh, education facilities for children and young people is to be welcomed, and so I would you know, make that clear at the outset. But I think the, my focus here is around procedural issues in terms of the ministerial direction and the concerns around that, because this is a major capital project which has already been examined previously in terms of audit office reports. We're now having uh, a ministerial direction coming because the uh, permanent secretary is unable to approve because of value for money considerations. As you've said, Chair, you would expect in terms of economies of scale that the value for money proposition would actually improve, um, but in this situation it doesn't. So there is obviously concerns in relation to that. Um, I think for me that the sort of two things is that there was uh, fresh start money provided uh, for integrated schools and it's about important to get an insurance uh, 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 sorry uh, an assurance that this project is not going to detrimentally impact upon other projects uh, that are uh, earmarked for that funding and the other real concerns I think it's important to note this today is that um, and it says in point 61 of the ministerial direction or the 
papers associated with it. It is important to note that this profile was prepared based on the construction industry picture prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And further consideration of spend profile will be required. There's real concerns that we're actually we're potentially going to require another ministerial direction in relation to this. And maybe the question from my contribution here now is, when does the point come where decision is made that we're past the point of no return in relation to this? Because there's already in front of us today a concern around value for money consideration. Don't underestimate the importance of this scheme. But just procedurally, as you said, Chair, this is what we're here for today. You know, when, when's the point when we actually consider we went too far and we must proceed? Because there's concerns that there's rising costs associated with this. Uh, there's a number of points there. I suppose uh, it's a question for ministers then uh, to make uh, a press button on that. Yeah. Uh, I suppose we'll not know where this sits until tendering process has gone through. Um, you mentioned the point there about, I suppose, this construction cost inflation uh, in a COVID environment, and, and that's not just impacting on this project, but right, right across the piece. I suppose just given the sheer scale of this project is a huge project, uh, it'll be just important to, um, and we will monitor it, I suppose, the fact there is uh, a direction on it is a key cost on the progression of it, as we would in any project of this scale. So we will factor that into our ongoing monitoring of the of the costs and come back if necessary. Um, yeah, but I think it's in. I suppose that's the whole point of um, a ministerial direction. It's the prerogative of a minister then to, <coughs> for wider reason, to say, well, why this doesn't meet a value for money test? There are wider reasons for actually. Progress. So a lot yeah. of ministerial directions are of that, of that uh, maybe things that can't be quantified in purely figure terms. Uh, sort of points, Mr. Yeah. Uh, and acknowledge those points. You know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, members are, you know, there are complicated factors here. Some of it may be for other committees or members to pursue uh, elsewhere. But in terms of the public accounts committee, uh, um, are you content that we note it at this stage? Or is there any action that uh, anyone considers it appropriate that we take? Bear with me just a moment, Chair, because um, yes, the, connect please, the connection has failed for just a moment. I need to get everybody back on. Oh, <coughs> we're in court. It's only just been for the last minute, actually. So for everyone to answer uh, the Chair's question, <laughs> um, I need to set this back up. OK. Sorry. Uh, I didn't hear you there. Maybe. There was a technical problem. We lost our court and that the, the connection went down. So we're oh. re-establishing. Okay. okay. So everybody's back. Everybody's back. Now, Sorry about that bit of a uh, technological glitch there. Uh, can everybody hear me again? Uh, and in particular, uh, Cahill, because oh. uh, our, our <laughs> member, can you hear me, Cal? Yes, sir. Sure. Oh. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, they, they, uh, Various comments have been made about uh, this ministerial direction. Um, um, I, I was simply saying that uh, procedurally, uh, in terms of the Public Accounts Committee, um, it's been notified to us. That the appropriate procedures seem to have been taken. There may be other issues that members may wish to follow uh, outside of the Public Accounts Committee or, or on other committees. Uh, are you content that we simply note this at this stage? Mr. Muir? Chair, I, I totally accept that because it's procedurally I, I understand our place in relation to this and what the CNG is replied to is entirely correct. That's the way to go for us. Uh, I think we do note it, but I was going to propose uh, that we provide a copy to the Education Committee because there's obviously policy issues arising out of this in terms of the impact of home fresh start funding. But that's for them probably rather than for us, you know. That's a good practice. Uh, I would hope that they would have got a copy as well, but I think that would be good practice. Are members content that we would forward a copy? Okay. Yeah. Read. 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 Uh, members, uh, we now uh, propose we're going to close session uh, for consideration of our draft report. As we finalise reports, it, it, it's not done in public session, as you appreciate. So it's the draft report into the speeding up of the justice system. Are you content we go into committee at this stage? Read. Read.
Great. Okay. I press this button on. Yes, sir. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.